Okay. Chapter 12, Single Case Evaluation Designs. I like to think of the single case design as being where common sense intersects with research methods. Here in slide two, we can see what we're going to be covering today. Uh, a little bit of introduction to single case designs, the logic of them, and then some examples. Single case designs were developed with the direct practitioner in mind and gives you the opportunity to evaluate down to the individual case level. Slide three. The single case evaluation design is in fact a type of time series design. And it makes up for what it lacks in the breadth of distribution of individuals in the design by making repeated observations. With the repeated observation, it attempts to clearly place the cause and effect into a clear relief. And the point of, of um, the single case design is in order to develop a pattern of um, coincidence that, if it is established, would make other alternative explanations unlikely. So we can see that we're, we're talking in terms of unlikeliness versus terms of probability that you may see in the more rigorous research designs. The single case design is pretty straightforward and naturalistic. It has a baseline phase, then it has an intervention phase. Um, I tend to want to avoid Rubin and Babby's terms of control phase and experimental phase because those have very clear connotations in the established research um, literature as meaning something. A, a control group is a group that is randomly selected. Otherwise, it's a comparison group. So this should really be called the comparison phase uh, since we lack random selection. Uh, Similarly, because we lack random selection, um, we shouldn't use the term experimental. Okay, five, fifth slide. So the distinguishing characteristics of the um, single case design for social workers is that it has a sample size of one, um, which is essentially the individual or group that you are um, tracking. And its chief limitation is um, its dubious external validity. And um, quite often when you're when you're looking at a single using a single case design, it's in a an evaluation um, uh, anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, that you don't have external validity. You're intending to mainly show that your intervention was effective with a particular client. So the converse of having, converse of having dubious external validity is that it has high internal validity, which makes it a useful tool for identifying prob promising interventions and for testing uh, studies. It can also be used as a clinical tool to show clients uh, the kind of progress that they're making. A 
a number of case single case designs um, that show repli replication uh, as as you accumulate um, single case method after single case method uh, begins to um, support uh, that the intervention is generalizable. So, and, and of course, it's very, very useful in supporting uh, your program evaluation. Here on the sixth slide, we can we can um, <coughs> uh, see that single case designs are useful. Uh, as a part of an evidence-based um, practice in order to evaluate um, um, uh, your outcomes. When you're using evidence-based practice, uh, the single case design becomes a way you can be sure you're getting the outcomes that you expect. Now you may ask, what outcomes should I expect? Well, quite often when you look at evidence-based practice, you will get a pretty clear idea of how effective those practices have been with different populations. <clears throat> now, they're not without um, their problems. Um, some um, obstacles uh, are that client crises may not allow practitioners to collect sufficient baseline data and <clears throat> this may not uh, be solely limited to uh, client crises, as um, is the case with um, uh, <clears throat> uh, many agencies. Uh, if they don't have a waiting list, they're not going to want to have a client hang around essentially doing nothing uh, and not receiving services. Um, sometimes we have heavy caseloads, and, and those kind of things can uh, um, uh, increase the difficulty in collecting data. Um, however, um, um, it um, it should should not necessarily be an issue. Um, one is. Um, required to keep track of client progress. Uh, so it, it's more about being smart about the type of data that you collect versus not collecting it at all. Perhaps a bigger problem is that your peers or your supervisors may not recognize the value of a single case design. Um, that's what Ruben and Babby say. I am a little skeptical of that. With such a difficulty in getting evidence-based practices um, uh, implemented because people are, or are unsure about research methods, then uh, I would say the contrary, that you demonstrating your single case designs uh, could actually demonstrate that you look like you know what you're talking about and therefore will be more belie believable. And finally, clients may resent the extensive monitoring. And again, I think where you look at um, where uh, clinical uh, common sense intersects with evaluation if you are monitoring something that is important to the client, uh, something like their client goals, uh, then they're probably less likely to be to see the monitoring as extensive or intrusive. Just like any other research pro project, <clears throat> we can see that that uh, we are confronted in single case designs with uh, operationally defining what our target is, what the goals are, 
choosing what to measure and <clears throat> how to use triangulation to add rigor to our uh, evaluations. So the rigor of def d definition should not be a problem, as you should be doing this as a part of your ongoing clinical practice anyway. And again, what to measure uh, should be drawn directly from your client goals. <clears throat> so when we operate um, operationally defined target populations and goals, we do this like we, we, we saw in quasi-experimental uh, methods and in experimentation. Um, uh, we select uh, specific indicators of the target problem. Uh, uh, and again, we tie these to the client goals because single case design is primarily a tool for evaluation of individual practice. So for example, if you were um, uh, in family counseling, for example, and, and the client system sets a goal of having one spouse or the other uh, express affection more frequently, well, suddenly you have a measurable goal, and that ties in with what they are interested in in changing. Um, sometimes with, with um, um, some client goals, the direct um, target you know, isn't easily measured. For example, they, they give the example of depression here. <clears throat> and so quite often we rely on uh, things like depression inventories, uh, those sorts of things to uh, be somewhat objective in our establishment of depression. And that can be problematic because we don't want the um, client to be having to fill out a, you know, a Beck depression inventory or RAND scale every time they come in for a, an appointment. So we can, we can target um, the most salient symptom. So for example, uh, things like uh, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, um, frequency of sexual urges are all indicators of, um, of depression. So we may actually just ask about those. And uh, oftentimes clients will have their, <clears throat> their own uh, particular goal that they're most interested in. Now, Ruben and Babby seem to use the term negative and positive uh, in, the, in, its, uh, in its common uh, vernacular sense, and, 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 and that's okay. I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a little uh, uh, disappointed in that because um, negative and positive also have, have, um, have um, specific research terms. So they indicate directions. Um, 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 so um, uh, it's helpful if we, we we can we can develop things that we measure that uh, will show increases in the case of, uh, for example, with the marital situation, uh, positive uh, uh, statements. Uh, or effect, you know, uh, indicators of affection, um, whereas um, a negative indicator would be a, a reduction in um, um, child temper tantrums. Um, uh, so it's a good thing that, that it's reduced, but because the numbers go down, it's a de decrease and is therefore negative in research terms. So. Remember to think about that. And sometimes negative indicators can also include the absence of. So what is it that you measure? Here on slide nine, we, we, uh, uh, we get a hint that uh, our um, target indicators 
uh, are something that occur uh, frequently enough that we can show some sort of a progress as a result of what we're doing. And it also has to be something that's legitimately linked to to our intervention. So if our intervention is is designed to reduce depression, uh, we don't want to have an indicator, uh, say, uh, of cigarette smoking. Uh, sometimes um, infrequent events are not uh, really uh, useful in single case designs. So, so for example, uh, uh, suicidal ideation versus suicide acts, uh, quite often with clients with borderline personality or perhaps who are in a depression, the suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideation, will be regular uh, occurrences, and, um, and we can track those, uh, whereas acting out on those thoughts can be relatively rare, and it gets kind of hard to, to use those as, as indicators. <clears throat> as in so many other parts of research, uh, triangulation is an important part of single case design. It's probably more important in single case design than perhaps some other um, um, other um, uh, indicators. So, 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 for example, um, um, uh, if if we have a self report and an other report, uh, you know, for example. Uh, the child says one thing, oh, I'm doing, you know, real well in school, and you ask their parents or their teacher, and you might find the same or a different story, you would be triangulating. Also, there can be other indicators. Um, uh, for example, you are uh, <clears throat> um, counseling someone on depression, and uh, part of their depressed Symptomology is that they have a hard time getting up and going to work. Uh, so you can triangulate using their subjective reports of their of their moods and how they feel with uh, reports from 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 work, you know, about how often they're they're showing up. So so again, we think about triangulation. We can we can think about uh, multiple types of data sources. Um, so and again, this is this looks just like what we saw in other research models, um, but we can triangulate between available records, um, uh, meaning uh, quite often in in um, um, clinical situations or in in um, uh, child protective services, those kind of things that the, the person has a chart someplace that you can go go connect to. Um, Interviews, self-report scale, and also direct observation by yourself uh, as a as a practitioner, and and of course, uh, all these have um, um, their upside and their downside. You know, the practitioner who is also the evaluator of their own practice has a built-in bias. You know, they, you know, we want to appear good to ourselves. We also want to appear good to, you know, supervisors, uh, those sorts of things. <clears throat> um, the client uh, measurement uh, is something that that um, we need to concern ourselves with, as uh, <clears throat> we learned earlier in, in some of the other uh, measurement uh, techniques that even a, an interview e talking to an anonymous um, uh, research assistant or even filling out an anonymous uh, survey online tends to want to uh, bias the answer to please themselves, to appear socially desirable, or avoid uh, disappointing somebody. And so when, you, when you've got a much more um, meaningful relationship, um, um then um, um 
you may have problems. So. Now, available records um, are um, um, oops, I skipped one. Significant others. Significant others can be as biased as as anybody. Uh, so, so again, uh, it's important to think through uh, what skin they have in the game of 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 whatever uh, you're you're measuring. Now, available records are um, um, uh, often useful for uh, obtaining a, a retrospective uh, baseline. Um, now, uh, this is only true in the case of, of um, clients who, who, who have an ongoing um, uh, relationship with you, uh, and you might want to be wary of uh, establishing your baseline from uh, available records that come from uh, external sources that you cannot necessarily evaluate. So, so be question question yourself about the re reliability of 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 the available records. Um, uh, <clears throat> people often use. Um, um, client outcomes in when they when they get get reviewed, and so so um, there's a built-in bias to report more favorably. So always kind of remember that. Now, self-report scales um, uh, uh, make them convenient, um, uh, brief, uh, and find ways to ensure uniformity. Um, now, clients may lose interest in repeating scales, uh, and of course there's the social desirability biases, but many evidence-based practices have a uh, some sort of a ongoing repeated scale built into them. Uh, items which initially were put there for, for research purposes, but w which they discovered uh, actually have um, uh, good clinical value. So we can see some 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 reliability and validity troubles in this um, slide 14 with um, <coughs> uh, single case designs. Uh, as far as uh, validity goes and reliability goes, um, in, in in regular studies, uh, there <coughs> there's um, an anonymous relationship. Uh, in single case design, there's uh, uh, not not only not anonymous, but quite often a special relationship. Um, uh, oftentimes, in in regular research, instruments are um, get, you know data is gathered you know one, once or twice, and um, and um, in single case designs, we we often uh, ask uh, on a weekly or however often we meet basis, and so that repetition starts to to bleed out some of the validity of even Likert scales. Um, and and finally, the the, the score uh, has no bearing on whether the respondent is benefiting from services in a regular study, whereas in single case design, the intervention phase. <coughs> May involve more bias than the baseline phase, so uh, that's important to know. You know, we as practitioner evaluators know when the, the intervention phase is being recorded than uh, w than when uh, a regular research project is happening. So some bias may uh, may um, persist. Now, Ruben and Babby persist in referring to single case designs and using the term experiment. Um, I really caution you against using 
the term experiment, and and I don't know whether they have a um, agenda that they're that they're uh, working on to try and uh, garner legitimacy and acceptance of single case designs, but when communicating with others outside of your profession, particularly uh, people with extensive psychological uh, training uh, in that discipline. Uh, the single case experiment under no single case design under no um, uh, case is going to look like an experiment to them. So try to use try to use design and method and some of that kind of language. The direct behavioral in, uh, observation um, <clears throat> can be a time issue, and so you ought to to um, uh, at every opportunity, uh, try to use those um, direct observations that you would anyway as a part of your normal practice. Um, that way you don't have to necessarily add additional resources. Um, <clears throat> sometimes um, direct behavioral observation isn't practical for you, the the, the researcher uh, slash practitioner, and so um, uh, you have to then get buy-in from some source outside of your your direct control. And then finally, self-monitoring, of course, is again vulnerable to uh, you know the various measurement biases, and so um, it's something to to um, uh, concern yourself with. Um, when we're doing a direct behavioral observation, the less intrusive uh, that we can be, probably the better. Uh, so um, we consistently and throughout our clinical practice are aware of and pay attention to numerous uh, indicators of well-being. So, for example, if you are uh, again working with people who are depressed, you might you know look at their um, their affect to see if they appear sad, see if they lack energy, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, if if you're um, doing interventions on parenting um, uh, and family preservation, you may. You may go into the home and and you've got your list of 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 checklists that you do to make sure that they're um, um, going to be able to keep their child in their home uh, uh, those sorts of things uh can be done without uh drawing a lot of attention to the fact that you're observing um, but quite often the participant is keenly aware that you're observing them and so they are predisposed to behave in socially desirable ways. Um, um, <clears throat> and, you know, in in those instances, um, um, you know, for example, I'm thinking of things like mood diaries or, or, or having people fill out um, um, regular um, checklists of, of behaviors on weekly visits. It, the more you can tie those into uh, your ongoing, you know, therapeutic um, 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 work, the less it will seem like an in, uh, that the research is intruding into the um, into the uh, clinical process. If something can be changed um, or eliminated, um, have some sort of a quality um, become different in it, then you can observe it. And if you can observe it, you can um, quantify it. So, so w with each important term, think, uh, what does the change look like? 
Is it a change of frequency? Is it a change of duration, a change of magnitude? Um, you know, thinking of something like a migraine headache, for example. Say you're doing um, uh, mindfulness meditation training to inhibit um, migraine uh, headaches. Uh, you could measure all three of those: quantity, uh, frequency, how 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 often is the person experiencing the migraine, the duration, when they have them, how how um, uh, long do they persist, and then the magnitude: how how bad are they? How, what is their their reported scale? And and uh, uh, nurses and emergency rooms will often use the a one to ten scale um, for magnitude, and one can even even start to combine some of those two. So, um, is frequency staying the same but duration going down? Is frequency going down but duration staying the same? Uh, are both of those going down yet magnitude staying the same? Or perhaps all of them are going down? We know that our interventions are are working with more confidence when we have um, established that there's a baseline um, that shows a stable trend. And what is a stable trend is going to depend on on what you're you're working with. And and it's important to be wary of uh, things like uh, depression, for example, which which in, in some people have a seasonal component that your 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 measurement isn't isn't kind of riding on the back of of a uh seasonal trend um, <clears throat> five to ten measurements for for a baseline um, uh to be realistic if you're working with with a client um and you see them every week um, putting off for 10 weeks an intervention probably is, is going to be a non-starter. <laughs> uh, you're not going to be able to bill insurance for, oh, I'm waiting for my measurement period. So that's where the value of, of, of finding ways to, to retrospectively measure the baseline. That means to look back at the baseline. Now the seriousness of of the um, client's problem may be a factor in the baseline um, phase, uh, they, they're, and it may may be a, a factor in the entire single case design, since uh, the um, uh, problem may may not change uh, much in any event. So in the years that have passed, 23 to be exact, since I studied single subject designs, is what they were called back in 1989 when I took research methods at the University of Kansas uh, and used Rubin and Babby's research methods for social work, um, which is um, uh, the first edition. Um, the um, they haven't changed much. They still report the basic A, B, A, B, A, B, et cetera, um, uh, designs. And uh, the only thing that I've, I've, I've seen them add is, is this B design. So um, uh, <clears throat> so it, it, it's good that, th that they're, they are a stable um, um, research design, that, that there hasn't been such blowback since they were introduced into the lexicon and into the social work canon and to the bag of tricks that practitioners can use, practitioner evaluators can use, that they've been eliminated. Um, so they've only been expanded upon. <clears throat> so here's our, here's our uh, 
basic uh, single case design, the AB model, with, with the A standing for uh, baseline. Hey, where's my pencil? Baseline. And then the B standing for intervention. You'd think they would have said BA uh, or BI, um, but they use AB. And there's a reason they do that. It kind of ties in with with um, with traditional research methods. But in this particular graph, we can see that the person was um, uh, being monitored for frequency of antisocial behaviors. And when they first showed up in the wherever they are, probably some some, some sort of a, uh, incarceration or hospitalization that they were doing 10 per whatever period, day, 10 per day uh, when they first show up. They caught, dropped to 9 and then to 8, stayed there, went down to 7, then to 6, then to 5, hung out at 5, jumped back up to 6, jumped down to 5, went to, stayed at 5, then went to 4, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So, we do see a bit of a, a, a stable pattern down here in the last um, four weeks of the intervention phase. However, when we when we step back and look kind of across time, we can see that they were on a downward trend anyway. And so it, it becomes a little bit um, dubious for us to assert that we had anything to do with this person's change. Now, slide 21 here uh, shows a little bit of a different uh, take. Uh, we've got the baseline phase. We're monitoring somebody for one, two, three, four, five and a half weeks, it looks like. Uh, and they're just getting worse. So their level of depression is increasing. So something happens over the course of the next six, seven, six weeks. They, they, they start to go down. They're getting better. Then the intervention is withdrawn, and they're remaining the same. They're not getting continually better, but they're also not going back up. So we re-implement the intervention, and they go down to a normal level. So in that scenario, we would tend to think that uh, it's, um, it, it, it is effective. Now, lacking a A, B, A, B, A, another A over here, which is another period of observation without intervention, we just simply don't know if, if the person's going to you know, skyrocket and go back up to their previous level of functioning or not. So... Here is an example um, where somebody is doing multiple baseline design rather than single subject design uh, <clears throat> or single case design. Um, so what they have is, is three separate residents, and they're all being measured on the same variable, level of hopelessness. and they're being observed over the same amount of time. However, uh, <clears throat> they receive their interventions at different times. So here we see that, that resident one, their intervention starts at day five and a half, day five probably, day six, something. Uh, it's kind of unclear. Um, and then it immediately drops, but then it then it very quickly levels off to to a lower, I'm assuming more desirable level. With resident two, instead of starting at day five, they started after day eight. So so what we can see here is a, is a fairly steady baseline, and then a drop down to uh, functioning at, at about the same level as that we can, what we can see there with resident one. And then the, the, the resident number three, they have to wait almost two weeks to get any intervention. 
their baseline is about the same with a slightly rising trend. If we, are, if we were to draw a uh, regression line through there, you would see that it goes something like that. You'll learn more about regression lines next semester. But we can see again, as in the resident one and resident two example, once they get the intervention, they drop down to this level and quickly uh, kind of level off. So we would we would say that you know the intervention seems to be the thing that that's working, and from then on we'll start giving them the intervention when they walk in the door. Um, now sometimes you have. Um, individuals who are getting multiple um, interventions. Uh, so in this case, they, you know, it's about employment, the number of days worked, it's the outcome uh, per week from zero to seven. And we see we've got social skills training is uh, in there for one, two, three, four weeks. We, we have some other kind of probably extrinsic reward for working, one, two, three, four. I don't know exactly what that would be other than money. Um, and then case advocacy. Uh, and we can see that during the baseline, you know, the period they're, they're working about one day out of every four weeks. In the social skills training, they're working, again, about one day out of those four weeks. Uh, when we when we move to a rewards based system again one day out of four weeks and then finally they've adopted case advocacy and they're working uh, four days one week five days the rest of the week essentially full time if it's an eight hour job <clears throat> uh, so um, we would tend to say, oh, well, case advocacy is the way to go and forget about all the rest of this stuff. But however, um, we can see that the social skills training and the rewards uh, precede case advocacy as well as preceding the increase in, in, in the days worked. So which, which, which is which? Which caused which? Uh, was it the was it the um, case advocacy alone that did it, or was it case advocacy that built on these these other uh, interventions? We'd probably want to do multiple designs here. Some will move case advocacy to the to the front here. Do it first and see what happens. Uh, move around case advocacy to the middle. And follow, you know, put social skills first, followed by case advocacy in one case, reward first, followed by case advocacy in the next case. We can also switch reward and social skill around to see what happens. So, so even though it looks like case advocacy is the is the is the way to go, it's it's still a little clear, unclear until you've done a little bit more work. So um, when um, when um, analyzing uh, single case designs, uh, we re re rely an awful lot on visual patterns that depict the series of incidents, their frequency, their level, their trend, their direction, uh, and what we know about um, uh, a uh, uh, phenomenon. So what we can see here is uh, is we eyeball it. We we said, does it look like there was a there was a real change here? And one of the things that 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 um, they tend to think about, you know, our kind of subjective uh, analysis is that it works pretty well. Um, <clears throat> we can also do some types of statistical tests on what data we do um, uh, observe to kind of understand 
whether or not it's part of the normal chance fluctuations. Um, and we'll get into that um, more in depth next semester when we when we cover some time series stuff. But for right now, um, um, uh, we won't concern ourselves with it. Uh, and then, uh, and then finally, um, if there is a uh, you know a, an association of the problem with the the intervention and. Um, we still have to ask ourselves: Is is the change substantial enough from from um, um, uh, you know either a research point, a clinical point, um, some other standpoint, budgetary? Uh, and kind of the new kid on the block here of the single case designs is this. Uh, this rascal called uh, B designs, and you know, we really, um, we can we, we remember from um, um, uh, the A B A B that B doesn't mean baseline. You know, B means uh, intervention, and quite often we when we get clients, we don't have time. We we don't have the luxury to let them sit around and and uh, cause help, self harm for five to ten weeks. While we take a baseline, we've got to intervene right now, and so uh, we can see that this person with trauma symptoms come in here way up at the top. I don't know what the scale is; they don't provide that. Uh, but then quickly they move down here to to a, a low or zero level. Uh, I don't know what the measurements are, but um, again, these are especially useful when we already have uh, kind of a sufficient idea that. The intervention that we're doing is, is is going to do something because it's an evi it's a it's a recognized evidence-based practice, and what and we use the B design to really confirm that the direction of change is going in a way that's consistent with what um, uh, the evidence would suggest. So, so hang on, I'm a, I'll be working on uh, presentation part two for um, uh, session six. And, um, and I'll go ahead and upload this one and let you get started.